Okay guys, next up is uh, projectile motion. So this is a very special case of how we can use those Suvat equations from last time. These are going to come up a lot and they have a few different forms. So I'm going to go through a specific example of one today and we'll have a look at the other forms that they come in uh, in class later. So projectile motion. Uh, Projectile motion is basically just where you have motion that is happening in two dimensions at the same time. So uh, basically if you throw something any way other than just straight up and down, if it just goes up and down and that's just one plane, we're looking for things that sort of do this thing, that do that lovely parabola as they get thrown. Um, so they're moving vertically and horizontally at the same time. But the very important thing about projectile motion to remember is that we are going to treat the horizontal and the vertical completely separately. Because whenever we're looking at it, in the horizontal there is going to be no acceleration because we're going to ignore air resistance. So what that means is in the horizontal your speed is going to remain constant. However, in the vertical, we will have acceleration, and in most cases, that's going to be due to gravity. So they will be affected differently. So just a couple of key points to bear in mind when we are doing projectile motion, um, and they are that we do treat the horizontal and the vertical separately, that the only thing that is the same between these two um, planes of motion is the time. So they happen at the same time. Um, Another key point that will help you a great deal is to remember that the vertical velocity will be zero when the object reaches the peak of its fall. So if I'm throwing it in an upward motion, so if it's doing that parabola shape, once it gets up to the top up here, it's going to have zero in the vertical. That's going to be very useful. And the final point that is a very useful one to try and remember is that the time it takes for the object to reach the peak is half of the total time of flight assuming that it falls to the same distance that it started at. So that's when we consider the whole of the motion, where it's thrown, it goes up, and it comes back down, and it comes back down to the same point at which it was thrown from. So often the example is things like cannonballs or water being um, sent from hoses, things like that. Occasionally we will just look at half the fall, so say if we drop something, throw, oh sorry, if we throw something horizontally off a cliff, that's kind of like it started at the peak of the fall. So occasionally we will talk about those ones. Now the best way to do this is to give you an example. So um, here is an example question. So um, the lovely typical cannonball one. We're told something about its initial uh, velocity, the angle at which it's sent, and we're asked to calculate three things. So the maximum height, the time of flight, and the range. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, flip the uh, recording in a second. And I'm going to talk you through how I would answer this one. So I'm going to show you how these really need to be laid out so as to keep you organised, keep everything nice and clear and logical for you. OK, so first thing that's useful to do is always draw a sketch of uh, the information that you've been given. So we know that it initially goes at 200 metres per second at 30 degrees to the horizontal. So I'm just going to draw in that we could split that into the initial horizontal velocity and the initial vertical velocity. Next step is then just to resolve that. So the initial horizontal is going to be equal to 200 cos 30, because it's adjacent to the angle. And the uh, vertical is going to end up being 200 sine 30, because that is opposite the angle. Um, now I could calculate those um, as numbers, I mean the cos 30 is quite easy because that's just 0 0.5 but um, I, I think I'm just going to leave it as 200 cos 30, that way I get all the digits so it just makes it easier uh, or well, not easy, more accurate. So for the uh, first question it's asked us for the maximum height so that means we are working with the vertical so it's the vertical section we want to be thinking about. So I'm going to write down what I know about the vertical so I know that the initial velocity is going to be the 200 sine 30 in the vertical. The acceleration is going to be minus 9.81. Minus because I called the uh, initial vertical as being positive. So the acceleration is in the opposite direction. And I know that V will be 0 when it reaches the peak. And the distance is what I'm trying to find. 
So I know I've got u, a, v and s, so the next thing I need to do is select an equation. So the equation that has all of those in is v squared equals u squared plus 2as. I'm then going to rearrange that uh, to make s the subject, so that gives me s equals v squared minus u squared over 2a. Next thing is just to pop the numbers in. Um, because uh, v is 0, obviously, um, I'll just not bother writing that in. That'll give me minus 200 sine 30 over 2 times minus 9.81. Then grab my calculator and tap those numbers in, and I will come out with a distance of... Never calculate with an audience, folks. It is uh, 5.097 meters. So I'm just going to say that that's approximately equal to 5.1 meters. Now I've left the extra digits because they might be useful later on. So next thing it asked me to do it was part B. Part B it asked me for the time of flight. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write down to remind myself that that's going to be equal to two times the time to the peak. And I know a lot more about getting to the peak than I do for the whole time of flight and it uh, saves me from having to deal with a quadratic equation. So again I'm in the vertical so I'll just remind myself what I'm using. So u is 200 sine 30, a is minus 9.81 and V is still going to be zero because it'll be zero at the peak. But this time it's the uh, time that I'm trying to find. So next thing, pick the equation, V equals U plus AT. Then I will rearrange to make T the subject, so T equals V minus U over A. Then pop my numbers in. So again, I've got zero minus 200 sine 30 divided by minus 9.81. And when I pop that in, that's going to give me, it's going to be something in the range of 10, isn't it? Because 200 sine 30 is 100 divided by 9.81, so approximately divided by 10. So it will be 10.19 seconds. So my whole time of flight, which I'm going to be lazy and just write down as TOF, is going to be equal to 2 times 10.19 seconds, which is 20.38 seconds. So that's approximately equal to 20 seconds. Right, finally then is going to be the uh, range. So for the range, I'm going to be using the horizontal information this time. So it's the range, so I'm interested in the horizontal, just to remind myself. So what do I know about the horizontal? So first up, I know the initial velocity is going to be 200 cos 30. And I know that the time is going to be the same as the time for the, uh, for the whole flight. So that's going to be 20.38 seconds. I'm just going to use those extra significant figures in case they make a difference. So the distance is therefore going to be equal to the initial velocity times the time, which is 200 cos 30 times 20.38, which gives me, when I tap it into my calculator, comes out at 3,531 metres. So I'm going to put that to a sensible number of figures, so that's going to be 3.5 times 10 to the 3 metres. And that's how we do that. Hope that's nice and clear. The way it's laid out should be nice and easy to follow.